Goddard for setting a screen. Because of physical play, although Jordan Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Izzo dying for a moving screen. It's that dreaded moving screen. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Moving Screen Pod. I'm Brendan Quinn. There is Dylan Burkhart. I'm looking right at him. Dylan, good morning. It is Monday, March 20th. First round, second round of the NCAA tournament complete. And it looks like a, uh, I don't know, this is a very morbid comparison, but it almost feels like the, the morning after, you know, a field battle. And there's just bodies littering the the field. And uh, that is the state of the Big Ten. Eight in to the NCAA tournament. One still around, still standing uh, off in the distance. Well, actually, uh, Wisconsin still standing. (laughs) Badgers fighting on and then I see. In in the wrong tournament. Um, But Michigan State, all the credit in the world for uh, making it to Tom Izzo's 15th. Sweet 16, pretty incredible achievement. Uh, great showing by Michigan State. Uh, and then the rest of them, seven down, Purdue, Indiana, Northwestern, Maryland, Illinois, Iowa, Penn State, out. What say you, Dylan Burkhart? Well, I think first of all, before we get to maybe the elephant in the room, the seven foot four, uh, several of those teams – that might be out, I think at least like mm-hmm. played up to expectations, right? Like, I think you have to give Maryland probably exceeded expectations. I think everyone in the world picked yep. them to lose. They won. Uh, Northwestern won a game in the NCAA tournament. That's an accomplishment. Penn State won a game as a 10 seed, gave Texas a game. I think it's not fair to completely count out. Like we said all along, there's going to be a lot of teams that are not really favored to make the second weekend. And I think you have to give credit mm-hmm. to some of those teams that did. Um, Illinois went out like a beautiful mess that it's been all year. Iowa, maybe not so much, but reality is other than Purdue, it wasn't like astronomically bad, right? Like one well, of those. Okay. It's a big other than. I, I agree. Yes, yes, yes. They, 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 by expectation measurement and, you know, uh, that, that's all, all well and good. But um, Big Ten basketball is not built to produce one second weekend team in a season. And um, I think it's a, uh, you know, is indictment a strong word? Yeah, probably. However, um, when, when you're on the outside, look at it. And that is how the big 10 certainly feels right now of how the national championship in the sport is going to be determined while in football, didn't I, you know, at least regularly in the, in the college football playoff uh, basketball is like not in the conversation. Um, you know, Penn State for it being as great of a story as it is that it's in the Sweet 16. I don't know if anyone is uh, considering them a national champion, Michigan chip contender. What, what would I say? Penn State, uh, uh, Michigan. another world Mi- that would be fun, yeah, but- yeah, that would be fun. But you know, the, the Big Ten does not have a national championship contender in the NCAA tournament right now, Sh- sure. But also, there were no preseason top. 15 teams in the Big Ten. I think yeah, it's telling that's, that. that's so, bad. <laughs> but is that a product of – that's a different problem than maybe what we would talk about as a quote-unquote NCAA tournament problem a couple years ago, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I feel like the problem of why the Big Ten doesn't have a title in 20 years or 22 years, whatever it is, is much more about – like. Big Ten's actually been a very good league, I would say, at getting a team in the Final Four, right? Like Michigan State, Michigan have made the Final Four several times in the recent times, Wisconsin, right? Like, I don't think that's the huge issue. It's kind of a lot of those times those teams have made the Final Four and they haven't been at the level of maybe the favorites in the tournament. So I don't know. I just think, obviously, it's disappointing to not have a contender. But the reality is we knew before this week that there was only one contender and we weren't really sure they were like the best contender by any stretch of the imagination. So I, I hear what yeah, you're I also saying. right at, at times this season though there were certainly moments of you know Illinois goes out and play wherever the hell that tournament was and people were talking about them being oh man you know maybe they're 
Maybe they're legit. Maybe they have a shot at this thing. Indiana, there were moments this year where people wanted to kind of buy in on that. It was all bullshit. And Purdue's right. out in the first round of Fairleigh Dickinson. It was. I mean, Dylan, come what? on. Just all get right, on well, board with right. this. It is just bad. It's just bad. I know there's I know there is um some texture to this, but it's just like the same conversation every year is, is no, you know, I don't know. I think I'm just tired of watching Big Ten basketball. <laughs> this is like I'm really I'm in the clinic right now. I think there's a notable difference between how programs in the Big 12 and the SEC are operating at the top that is lapping the programs at the top of the Big Ten. Would you agree mm-hmm. with that? Mm-hmm. I don't know that there's some huge difference between like the Big East and the Big Ten or the ACC. I'll tell you what the difference the is. Ten. There's four Big East schools in the Street 16, and there's one Big Ten. Three. Three. The Big East two seed got run by a Big Ten team. So, <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, I get what you're saying, but at the end of the day, I, I don't know. How many, like, it's just, you think there's that big of a gap in that, in between those schools where I think there is a huge gap. Like, SEC schools, I don't even know if they're operating at full capacity right now, and it feels like they're ahead of everyone. And mm-hmm. I think there's just a lot more momentum behind some of the top programs in that league that doesn't exist with top programs in the big league. That's the risk I would say right now. Okay, let's talk about Michigan State. Um, you know, a, a team that for I, I was watching that game versus Marquette yesterday, and I I heard you, I heard you in my brain. You heard and me. You, That's you're, scary. You're, yes, you you talking about, um, you know uh, that they just felt susceptible. Um, to an off shooting day, and that like that just kind of being the 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 possible fatal flaw of of when they get knocked out of the tournament, and you know like when they started that game or midway through the second half, whatever, when it's they're one for fourteen on threes, you're like, oh, you know, this is in. Um, they're gonna they're gonna lose an NCAA tournament game going two for sixteen uh, on threes, you know, and. They found a way. So it's like they survived that. Um, and off to the Sweet 16. You look very confused. Well, you have said that on this podcast. That <laughs> No, that's all. That's not. So I, I just, not at all what I was thinking. So we got to work on our sort of, uh, when okay. I was watching that game, we got to work on our sort of telepathic connection there. But I think that game was telling because it was really everything that Michigan state hasn't been for lots of this year, right? Like we've talked about Michigan state being a bad two point shooting team, not having great Mm. rim protection. Michigan state just played the number two, two point shooting team in the country and shot 58% on twos and allowed 36% on twos. That was the case that whole game. They were winning that game because they were getting shots at the rim. Something we have barely said about Michigan state this year, they were finishing at the, in the paint and Marquette wasn't. So I think Michigan state Mm -hmm. flipping that script, I think, like Michigan State got back to the defense we talked about them playing in November and December yes. that they weren't playing at all in February, and they flipped the script. Like we said, can they flip the switch? And they did two games in a row under a point possession. Um, I think one big takeaway is that Michigan State sets up very well against teams with big physical guards. Um, I think they did a really – like Drew Peterson kind of brings some of that Michigan State very well equipped to slow him down. Uh, Marquette wanted to play through Kolick and he just looked awful and they really kind of just took him out of the game. So credit to the defense credit. Like I didn't expect to say Michigan state is going to outshoot someone by 20% inside the arc. Cause that's just not what happened all this year. Um, so I think that was mm-hmm. the most telling part about this kind of upset for Michigan state is that they did flip the narrative that we've talked about all year. Not so much that they like the story was in the season, they're hitting threes and disguising these weaknesses. Well, now they won with what we thought was maybe a weakness. So credit to Michigan State for that. Yeah, Kolick's Kolick looked bad. Uh, the, the the thumb injury I think was was an issue. Didn't look like himself. Uh, Camp Jones kind of tried to to will them across the finish line. Uh, but Tyson Walker, that's a man. Yeah, big 23 shot, big points, shot, big shot. Eight of 14 on twos, a couple assists, 
um, played 36 minutes and was just the head of the snake. I, I thought um, really his his reputation as kind of a, a closing guy um, was was on full display. I mean, he is just he's got the thing where it's the last five minutes of the game and you can just put you put the ball in his hands with, I think, the utmost confidence of him having both the guts and the ability to get a shot, find a shot, make a shot. Um, and what a great story. Fucker, a New York kid. Um, and and went to Northeastern, had success there, transfers up to Michigan State, doesn't sit out a year, went through the adjustment last year, and now playing on the highest level. Um, Great stuff from Tyson Walker. Yeah, I, now he gets to play in that god. And- so I have a problem. I he's really good at scoring in the first thirty-five minutes of the game. I hate like the re- he's not like this magically better player in the last five minutes of the game. His scoring and ability to make tough shots all the time who, is very useful. Who makes the biggest shots for Michigan State late in games? What are you talking about? I mean, of course he plays good for forty minutes. No shit, but he at the end of games. They give him the ball, and he usually delivers. That's a reputation that is earned. There yeah, is evidence. Course. But he he's doing it the whole game. I just think that takes away from the fact that his ability to get in the paint and make tough shots, make tough twos all game is I think the only it's compl- reason Michigan State is here. I think it's complimentary to him already being a great player. I don't know. I just think it's very rare that you have a great player who makes shots late in games that isn't a really great player for the first 35 minutes of the game. It takes a, like, it's just I, a, I think we could think of some. <laughs> Like who? Someone that that is not good and then is good in the end of games. Usually, I mean, there's someone there, that carries there, a team. There are great players who are especially good late in games. Okay. That's all I'm saying. I think he was awesome that whole game. That's all I'm saying. I think his shot making okay. has carried Michigan State this year. Um, and like to be able to shoot when well, he's almost up to fifty percent on twos when he shoots so many either mid-range or sort of in-between mm-hmm. floater shots is very impressive. He is like a weird kind of outlier of like what, what you think of in the modern college game and what we talk of is get. And he's like, he's just so, um, the, his combination of being like slippery enough to get in into spaces, but he is like, I think the, some, some of us undervalue how strong he is. Like his body, like, he can go in and get like bounce off of guys like that Iverson thing of like he just can get you know teams can knock him on the floor a hundred times he's he just is durable and he's like a strong strong dude um, and you know this is his what thirty uh, third game of the season and you know he's showing that that durable side and you know his combination of that. Um, ability to get in there and his and his three point shooting. I didn't even realize it until yesterday when I like, pulled up his page during the game that he was, he was number one in the Big Ten in three point shooting in conference games this year. Forty nine percent on threes in league play this year. I don't think we ever even mentioned it. Yeah, he just still needs to shoot more. That's always like that's been the same shoot thing more. for him. Yes, all the exactly. time. He's not a volume three point shooter. Uh, Good Tyson Walker stat. He shoots 59% on runners, according to Synergy, which basically equates to 0.57 points per shot over expectation on how difficult those mm. shots are. 97% of the country. So he hit a bunch of those late. It's not really a shot he takes a ton of relative to other guys, but that shot I feel like is something he maybe didn't have as much last year that he's at. Really, he's always had the kind of mid-range game. Like he's always shot really well for three, but he hit a lot of really tough for in between shots that are, I think, new to his game, and to make it at that clip is just ridiculous. Hard shot taker, hard shot maker, um, and we have to mention Dylan Joey Hauser. Little revenge tour game uh, takes out Marquette, the old foe. Um, just like another incredible story, like Michigan State. Um, uh, they can get you in multiple ways. And, and, you know, it's just, I find it interesting that if you told me at, at midpoint in the season that 
they were going to be going to the Sweet 16. And in the game, um, in their second round game, that Malik Hall and Jay Nakins would basically be non-factors as scorers. Um, I don't know if I would believe that, but you know the, the Walker Hauser combination with with some some Hogard um, is enough. You know, like and, and next round, if you tell me that you know Malik Hall gives you a fifteen point game or Jay Nakins has a breakout game, I would believe that. You know, and that's like a that's an interesting combination. That I don't know how many teams have. Yeah, I I mean Walker Hauser has been like when. Joey Hauser makes shots, mm-hmm. Michigan State wins. When Joey Hauser doesn't make shots, Michigan State doesn't win. Joey Hauser made shots mm-hmm. this weekend, Michigan State's moving on. Like I think that's been the narrative with this team for a lot of the year. Uh, I think he had he plays like his win loss splits are very notable. Um, and they need that kind of scoring on the wing, and that does change things for them. Uh, I like. Malik Hall obviously hasn't been consistent this year. I think he just right. has never quite looked himself with all the like I he just has a variety of to find going consistency. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I I do think like just having Malik Hall does change what they can do defensively a little bit and it gives them options that maybe they didn't have when he was out. So it's still like he's an important player, but he's not what I think anyone would have thought he could have been this year. Um, but yeah. if Hauser is going to give you 15 points on any given night and hit a couple threes, like all of a sudden the game changes. So definitely credit for him in a huge spot. Um, I thought he was awesome. Uh, should we talk a little bit? Do you have more on last week or do you want to talk about Kansas State a bit? No, uh, no. The only other thought is on Michigan State coming out of the weekend is that it's also just, just kind of there. They have a, a three mo- three man rotation at the five of Maddie Sissoko. And Carson Cooper and a dash of of Jackson Collar with a little bit of small ball mixed in is 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 got him to the Sweet Sixteen. You know, it was enough to get him to the Sweet Sixteen, um, which is a credit to everything else there. Yeah, I, I'm curious how that rotation plays out. I feel like I want to like the small ball lineup, and then it never quite. Yeah. Pops and then I think Sissoko's rim protection was obviously pretty key over these last few games. I think there were some defensive miscues and then I think corrections that were made in game by Sissoko that were impressive. Um, and Michigan State, again, like they won inside the arc, which you have to give him credit for how well they defended around the basket. So credit for his growth for sure. Uh, this Michigan game now. Um... Ain't going to be easy. Michigan State, I think they opened as a one-point favorite. I think I saw that. Um, uh, it's it's kind of a toss-up for me. Um, Kansas State's good. Marquise Noel is a real one. Uh, don't let the size fool you. Listed at 5'8", but he is he is a basketball player. Second in the country in assist rate and can also get you um, in the scoring column. And, of course, Keontae Johnson, um, who everyone should be well familiar with at, at this point. Um, Kansas State's tough. Kansas State like kind of reminds me, it's, it, like in, in terms of its not as much as it, its makeup, but in its demeanor, they they kind of actually have some Michigan State vibes to them. I think. So interesting uh, comparison. Uh, I so Kansas State is a fascinating team to me because of just how dramatic some of their stats are and how much they just don't look like a big yeah. team at all. Um, they run probably more in transition and more isolation than any team in the country. So they're basically just going to try to play fast as hell and beat guys one-on-one. Um, they will play out of ball screens a lot. Obviously, Noel is a great passer, second in the country in assist rate, but it's very much like a up-tempo, push the pace. They don't really, they're a terrible defensive rebounding team. They have kind of a rim running big. They want to get out and play and really make it into sort of a, a pickup game almost. And you can see teams will fall into that, but it'll be very curious. Like Michigan State, we think of as a fast team, but the reality is this team actually slows the game down um, and they are yeah. not really the same sort of transition team. But you wonder like, okay, does Michigan State fall into that kind of game? And if you do, it's sort of just like, which like are my dudes better than your dudes, right? Like, is it just going to be Tyson Walker and Marquise Noel trading buckets back and forth? Like maybe, and that's just who makes more of them. Or I think Michigan state's path to win this game is 
slow it down, make it into more of a Big Ten game. And I don't really know how Kansas State will handle it. It's really tough, though, just because I can't think of a team like this that Michigan State has played, at least in a long time, yeah. right? You're just so in this Big Ten mold. Yeah. And, like, I meant, like, th- like they're make like, like, the makeup of the team that's all yeah, yeah. old, like there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of seniors and old guys and tough guys. And like, you know, like, like that, that makeup, but it, you know, the, the conflict is, is what's fascinating, but Kansas state, you know, a top 20 defense nationally, um, the, the battle for tempo, I think this is going to kind of be Michigan state tries to, I would think slow it intentionally. Um, I don't think you want, I've been, I mean, I've only watched Kansas state a, a handful of times, but if you get yourself into a track meet, um, you're, you're playing into their, their game. I think you want to make it a grinder. You want to make them playing in the half court offense. Um, it, frankly, if this turns into, uh, cleared out and Noel versus Tyson Walker, uh, sign me up for that all day. And Michigan state would, um, Probably take that too because you know. Don't forget about AJ Hogard, and he can go downhill and get you buckets. Um, damn, you're at, a, at the same clip as Tyson Walker. Yeah, I think. I guess like the most up tempo team Michigan State's played this year is probably Alabama back in Portland, Iowa. Um, I, yeah, this isn't, but like Iowa is up tempo, but without the ISO, right? Like Alabama is a similar yeah. team of like get up, just run stuff and just go. Um, Alabama or Iowa is running much more sort of like all that cutting. Like I was just so unique in that sense where yes, they play fast, but it's very different. Um, Keontae Johnson is sort of this like volatile guy. I feel like sometimes he looks amazing. Sometimes he's just sort of chucking up shots. That's an interesting matchup because when he's at the four, like I think you worry a little bit about how they're guarding him. But you feel pretty good about Malik Hall guarding him, uh, so that mm-hmm. that'll be sort of a give and take there to keep an eye on. Whereas really, it's going to come down to I think which point guard plays the better game, and I think Noel and Tyson Walker are probably going in this game thinking they're playing the best basketball anyone in the tournament. Let's see who gets it done. Yeah, and just as like a point of context on just how fast Kansas State is, like they led the Big Twelve in almost a possession and a half. Like that's that's a pretty large gap. They were at seventy two possessions per game in conference play. Uh, next closest was TCU at seventy point eight. Um, turnovers are an issue. They, it's, it's, I imagine it's a, you know a product of the style of play. But turning the ball over twenty one percent of your possessions um, or twenty percent of your possessions in league play at least, you know that's that that can get you in March. You know. Um, I don't know how they did in their first two games. If if they have kind of tightened things up here in March, let's just pull that up real quick. They're like a twenty um, twenty team. They're going to turn it over on twenty percent of the possessions, but they're going to force turnovers in twenty percent of possession. So it did a hell of a job against Kentucky, though. It's the style, and that's the other yeah. thing. I think you were like, do those turnover demons come back to Michigan State? Because uh-huh. I I think like we've seen that from time to time. Um, one other Kansas State thing. I think you could look at their profile. They're basically dead average in three point volume defensively, but they're 15th in like three point accuracy allowed. They only allow 30% three point shooting. I tend to like, I know everyone's going to say, oh, they're a good three point defense. I would look at that and say, well, maybe they're due to give up a bunch of threes, but hard to really say. Um, so I think Michigan State kind of looked at that and says, okay, can we crash the board similar to what we did a little bit early against Marquette? Because this is not a good defensive rebounding team. And then I think last in the in the Big Twelve. Yeah, so like there are weaknesses there. I just think you have to make it a Michigan State game, which is going to be slower. It's going to be a little more physical, and not sort of get into this up and down track meet and let Deontay Johnson or Marquise Noel just start get like heating up. Like the shot Johnson hit at the end of that game against Kentucky was just silly. Step back three. Like they have elite shot makers. Yeah, the. You know, it's it's funny when we we have a version of, of Michigan State that that we expect to see, and offensive rebounding is usually a part of that. And you know, this team's been like okay; it hasn't been one of these like dominant, you know, traditional. They're, they're not a great 
offensive rebounder. And, and and yet, you know, they they've found success in the NCAA tournament, and maybe that's a product going outside the league. Maybe it's just a product of who they played, whatever. But like now, you're playing a Kansas State team that you know, just based on the tempo numbers, they're going to be leaking, right? Like how how much are they sending to the glass if they're looking to cheat? And they are not crashing the boards. Like, yeah, Michigan State can go and get 30% of its misses in this game. And that even more so controls tempo. That even more so controls number of possessions and things like that. And and, ha- and keeping right control of the ball. Um, mm-hmm. That that to me seems like the recipe. And if they can turn it into scoring off by, by A.J. and Tyson and then also rebounding misses and finding shooters for, for threes, that that gets that can get you to the elite eight. I think out of this game. Yeah. So Marquette was three hundred thirteenth in defensive rebounding rate. Uh, mm-hmm. Kansas State is two hundred forty. So they're also very bad. Not as mm-hmm. bad as Marquette. I think any time that Noel ends up on Hogard, you need to crash. Like Kassan Wallace was just yeah. getting offensive rebounds just by being four inches taller than um, yep. Noel. So that's that's an opportunity there, right? Like I. Obviously, you're not going to have Oscar to get, go get you a bunch of offensive boards in that sense. Mm-hmm. But there is this not like a physical, rugged front line. It's much more of a get up and down, like length and athleticism, but not sort of this big imposing team. Um, so that's that's how I think the matchup fits up. Because Michigan State hasn't played a lot of teams that look like this, um, do you even have any kind of impression of its transition defense? So, like, I feel like a lot of Big Ten teams get artificially inflated transition defense just because they play games against teams like Wisconsin or whatever. But I also yep. think that Michigan State is generally going to be a good transition. Like they're a good transition defense team more than any right. like I think though I think they can slow a lot of that down. I think it will come down to how they guard the ball in the half court. Um more than anything. they do run a lot in practice for even though like they don't uh they, they might not translate this year uh in terms of being that kind of up and down Michigan State team. Uh, they do run a ton in practice, so they have to, which means they have to guard themselves. Uh, so <laughs> they, they do at least practice transition defense, even though they're playing, you know, slower teams in in, in the conference. Um, I guess so. The the potential matchup, if you can get through here, would Florida Atlantic or Tennessee? Um, you know, Tennessee is going to be favored in that game. There's a chance that they just kind of bloody up. FAU and, and can advance. Uh, Michigan State, Tennessee would be like uh, strap in for that one. Holy hell. They, they'll beat the hell out of each other. Yeah. Uh, Tennessee to me is the most physical team I've watched yes. this year. Uh, like you, if you just watch their bigs play and just watch them for like five minutes, you'll see like multiple plays where you're like, how is that not a flagrant foul? And they're just not even whistled. So like, <laughs> It's a they're just yeah. incredibly imposing and physical, and that's why they have the best defense in the country. I mean, I they're very much like flawed offensively. I there's just no upside there, but they're just so good, so physical. Um, that they basically you score 65 points and they're gonna win a game. So it's I think it's a I know everyone's gonna say Rick Barnes on a short prep, all this. I think it would be a really tough game for a Michigan State team that isn't particularly physical, right? Like Michigan State was yeah. able to out physical a team like Marquette and win in the paint. I don't know you're gonna win in the paint against this sort of Tennessee front line that just keeps coming and coming and coming. And I don't know. It's a tough matchup. Obviously Rick Barnes has provided plenty of sort of letdowns in the past. So we we know that's that's in, in the cards, but I I don't know man like that's a tough team, and I feel like it's a team that everyone sort of fell out of love with, but still is playing defense well enough to make it all the way to Houston. Yeah, I've got like conflicting feelings here of um, just line like Tennessee over Michigan State. If that is the matchup, I might like Tennessee over Kansas State. Um, if <laughs> At the same time, right, the, the other version of it is, like, this is classic Izzo that, you know, he, he gets this team into the Sweet 16 and 
it, the the opposing teams are it's it's the nine seed Florida Atlantic um, and Tennessee and, and Kansas State and it's just like if you just look at if you look at the team that's gonna ride its its history to another Final Four team it's it's Michigan State you know and and they are kind of do is those kind of do is this would be what his ninth if they can get out of here. Um, that said, I think I like Michigan State over Kansas State. I, I'm not sure I like them against Tennessee. It's the number one three-point defense in the country. I, I don't think it's a great matchup. I do think it's one of the the few teams that will be completely unfazed when Michigan State does try to like impose itself a little bit physically. Like you saw Marquette, like Marquette flinched, um, and and Tennessee ain't flinching. No, I. It would be more whether Michigan State punches. Like, Tennessee is the aggressor in every game they play. Exactly. I uh, I, it, to your point, though, it is a weak regional. I think three of the bottom four teams left in the Sweet 16 are in this region on Kempom. Uh, Kansas State's 21st, mm-hmm. FAU's 22nd, and MSU is 25th. And even Tennessee is the highest seeded left is six, right? So there's five teams left better than Tennessee. So it is a weak regional um, opportunity is there based on how things have played out. Um, but yeah, it, I, that's going to be a tough, tough game. If, if it is Michigan state, Tennessee, because Tennessee just has been another level of physical, I think this year that is hard for a lot of teams to match. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the real hope for, for Michigan state is that, you know, if you're running the Tennessee, that they can just have some absolutely abysmal offensive performances. Like, yeah, and, they have no and that's like the thing you, that's the thing you can't like plan for, right? Like there's a chance that they just go get to an elite eight and then go and score 54 points and, <laughs> and lose 65, 54. Um, at, like that they are capable of just not scoring the ball. So, yeah. um, Another thing, like, it's also Rick Barnes versus Tom Izzo, and it's Tyson Walker versus a team without a point guard. Like, there are paths to winning the mm-hmm. game for Michigan State, without a doubt. Uh, you had the better point guard yep. and the better coach. You have a chance, I'd say. Agreed. Um, okay. Um, we gotta get do we want to just hit on each team's exit? Yeah, I think we all know where we got to start. We're not going to break down each game, um, but just kind of your, 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 depart- your departing t- thoughts here. Let's start with... Purdue. Um, <laughs> for those at home, uh, Dylan is wiping his brow, massaging his temples. Uh, I thought they thought they figured it out a little bit. Big Ten tournament, won three games in three days, um, and then exit to Fairleigh Dickinson, a team that both lost to two teams transitioning into to Division One basketball and to one team transitioning out of Division One basketball that would be stonehill college and queens college and hartford university um team that finished second in arguably um the worst league in college basketball i think it is the actual worst league in college basketball they didn't even win the league and they just went and beat the team that won the big 10 by three games um this is like pretty simple if you just don't it's a bigger upset than UMB than UMBC. Um, sure, like I the, the semantics of that, whatever. Like it's one versus sixteen. I think it's I think it's far less significant in that it had happened before. Like I think being the first yes. team to lose to a sixteen was sort of this cultural event that never will come back. Now it's happened yes. before. I think that does change it. Whether it was a twenty-one mm-hmm. point spread or a twenty-eight point spread, well, like sure. Um, the reality is, like, I like to say that you know how a team is going to lose, right? And for Purdue, it's going mm-hmm. to be they're going to not guard anyone else except Zach Eady, and everyone else is going to miss wide open three pointers. And I think, like, they did play a pressing team, they turned the ball over a lot, but like, you got to make some shots. Oh, so many of those shots they had were just wide open, <laughs> and they're guys that can make shots, and they just didn't make them. Um, that, that's how you go home. Like, if you're guarding someone with two players, that means someone else is wide open every time down the floor. And they were guarding Zach Eady in the front, guarding Zach Eady in the back. 
That means someone else needs to put the ball in the basket, and it turns out no one could. That's that's it. That's Purdue. So, okay, the the you know uh, the, obviously the Matt Painter thing in history is having another conversation. Where, where where are you on that? What's like? What should he be like fired or like? No, I don't, he's not going to be fired, but like he's not going to be fired. But when you look at the just lack of success from this program in the NCAA tournament. Like, do you see a unifying theory? I, I don't, I think if, I get that they've lost three games in a row, the double digit seeds, whatever, right? Like, yeah, that sucks. But the point is if you're in a position to be upset by double digit seeds every time, just keep doing mm-hmm. what you're doing. Eventually you're not going to be, and you're going to make a run, right? They were also a shot away from, the final four. They also made the sweet 16 when they lost their best player to a broken, whatever, right. With Isaac Hosking. So they've had, I think that team made the sweet 16. Right. So I, I get that. It's frustrating. Um, and I like, I don't think that it means that you shouldn't keep doing what you're doing. I'm not sure how you're going to sure. do anything different. If you're Purdue, right. It's not like, I don't know. I think they have a great recipe. I don't like, Matt Painter can't go make shots for people. I don't know. I, I get that it's going to follow him and be his legacy or whatever, and that's fine. But if I'm Matt Painter, I'm going to say, let's do it again and not have that happen. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the the lack of shooting for this team was always going to be a thing. They were 275th in the country in three-point shooting. Um, and, like, dropping, I feel like. Yes, yeah. They, yes. Um, that, you know, some freshman guards, you made some freshmen, had some freshman moments. I mean, I, Lawyer, though, looked like the only one willing to even, you know, take shots without shitting his pants. <laughs> In that game, like, you, know, you almost just wish you could have, like, a senior Fletcher Lawyer on this team. You know what I mean? Like, him as a senior is just going to be, um, you know, I mean, probably someone better than player, but David Jenkins? Potentially. Um, it's a tough look, man. It, it 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 is a tough look, and you know you'll you'll wonder what they could have done if they had just gotten out of this game. You know if this was just such a um, it just turned into such a pressure cooker that they just collapsed. Like what would they have done against Memphis? I think they still would have lost to Memphis. But they might have lost the FAU. Yeah, I agree. Um, so they just weren't. They that it was looks like a team that was kind of tailor made to win the Big Ten, and I don't know about anything else. Is that fair? I I also think the guards, like, they were solid, but they had a, like, Braden Smith and Lawyer looked a lot better in November and December, and they had clearly mm-hmm. both hit some sort of freshman wall. And I think that's really what changed with this team. And I won, like, here's a question. If Zach Eady comes back, how is this team viewed? With the like, it's the same team in a lot of ways. Uh, they're gonna win 28, 29 games again, I would think. But are we just gonna say they're fake or are we gonna say they're a contender next year? I don't know, I have no idea what Edie's thinking and doing or whatnot. I mean, I, th- I would have guessed he's back. No, could be a second round pick. Hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, let's move on. Rough look from Purdue. Uh, <laughs> Indiana, you know, just I think the same thing, the point you made about Purdue, I think translates to Indiana. That if you're said, How are they going to lose? You say, Trace Jackson Davis, going to go out and try to do everything he can in his power. To, to take them, to will them to victory, and everything else around them just doesn't work out, and they get they run into a team that's tough as hell. That is Miami, and that is what happened. Yeah, no? and having no good players other than Jalen hood Shafino and Trace Jackson Davis turned out to be pretty costly. I think we knew those guys were the weak spot, but it was just very clear there was a gulf in athleticism on the wing in this game. And honestly, of all the games, 
this felt one of the more telling games of just what the Big Ten lacks, whereas mm-hmm. the shot making, the perimeter play, all of that, like, there's just not a guy like Isaiah Wong in the Big Ten. And the problem with having a guy like Isaiah Wong is he goes, like, two for 20 every three games, so Miami's been kind of up and down. But there's just right. a real lack of talented shooting guards in the Big Ten. Like, who's the best two guard in the Big Ten this year? There basically isn't. It's like Kobe Bufkin. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's oh, – yeah. that's So, like, there's no sort of pipeline of great two guards. So, I think maybe teams that are weak in that spot. Stands ball? Maybe. Sense ball, yeah. Like, sure. But Isaiah Wong's yeah. a lot better than him. So, I – Yeah. I also think – Also a, also a senior. Who? Wong. Wong. Yeah. Yeah, I also think I didn't realize maybe all year how weak Indiana was on the defensive glass. The 207th to finish the year, and like Omir just dominated them. Um, he got every <laughs> rebound, and you, you don't want that to happen when you have Trace Jackson Davis. Like, he needs to get some of the boards, race Thompson, but you can't give up 51% offensive rebounding rate in the NCAA tournament. Like, that's how you get run. Yeah. And they I, they looked shook in the first half. Like you saw Mike Woodson walking up the, and down the sideline, looking just totally perplexed, like yelling at people to wake up and stuff like that. Like what the hell was that? <laughs> it was the second round of the NCAA tournament. I mean, shit. You go out and you get outscored twenty five to fifteen in the first ten minutes of the game. Um, they just weren't ready. I mean, they just did not answer the bell. Whatever cliche you want to use. Um, Miami could just, I mean, Miami might have just been a flat out better team. That's fine. And you know what I mean? Like, but don't go out losing by 16 when you've got like a generational player and stuff like, you know what I mean? Like they just got, they, they got run out of there and, you know, they didn't answer the bell to, to start the game. They didn't answer the bell to close the game. And, you know, you can't get out score in the first 10 minutes and by 12 in the closing 10 minutes. Yeah. I, I tend to think Miami just have better players, but like I, I mean, they, that could be the, that I'm saying. Like it's, it's losing to Miami is not a major indictment. Like it's it's not awful. Nigel Pack, Isaiah Wong, like they've got guys. It's a good team. They're 27 and seven. You know, like that. But I just think you wanted to see more out of Indiana. Go out losing on a buzzer beater for God's sake. Yeah, man. But like my thing is, you could have had Matthew Meyer monsters. Ready to just chomping at the bit, ready to go. And I still think they will lost, right? Like, they're just, I don't see mm-hmm. it. It just was, I think that was a decisive win of a better team more than anything. And I also think, like, Indiana was never quite as good as we thought this year. The conference efficiency mm-hmm. numbers were never great. They were just never as good as we ever wanted them to be. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's kind of how I'll remember this year for Indiana. Can, can we just talk for briefly here about where does Indiana go from here? Because, yikes, year three for Mike Woodson coming next year, you, you lose Trace and Hood Shafino. I'm sure they've got a good recruiting class coming in. I have no idea. But, I mean, the drop-off in talent is going to be jarring. And I, is it, I, I don't know. It just seems like. It's just the same old, same old. Like, if you didn't take advantage of Trace Jackson Davis, then now what? I mean, they just hit the portal, right? That's everyone. Just go out and get some players. Hit that's the that's the job. That's what you do in April in that college basketball. Go find players because you're going to need them. That's, you can say that about every team in the league. Yeah. At least some teams in the league like have like discernibly good players returning. As many as you would think. If you like, yes, yeah, some guys might come back, but probably won't. Like, I don't know. Kevin, like, I don't know. We could talk about other teams, but there's a lot of teams that are in the NC tournament this year that are gonna need to go get replacements, whether it's Maryland, mm-hmm. Illinois, Iowa, like everyone. Yeah. So, I don't know. It just seems like Indiana, it, it's like starting some teams are gonna have a degree of continuity. It just seems like Indiana is going to be starting over um, in year three. And 
I don't know. That's how the sport works, though. I, you can't like blame. I don't know. I think the bigger indictment is not. It's easier to, to start over when you get a degree degrees. of success. Is is kind of my point. Like, you know, you wanted to make a run this year so that you have it, and it's you know proof of concept basically. And I mean, back to back NCAA tournaments after five straight misses. It's like a step in the right direction. I don't know. You got to see how they play next year. Yeah, I think I'm just saying with a potential lottery pick at guard and a first team All American at center, you want to do better than the, the second game in the NCAA tournament. Well, it, was on them to, it was on them to build around it better, and they didn't. How many is how how convinced are we that a lottery pick at guard is a way to make the second weekend of the NCAA tournament? Not sure it's the best recipe. I don't know. Well, maybe go get a. Maybe they should have gotten the better guard player of the portal last year. Yeah, so built the that, better. That's that's a fair. You know? Like they needed better players. They needed better guys. Around Trace, I agree. Um, I think it's just it's just annoying. I just want to see Indiana be good. <laughs> like I want Indiana to matter. You know what I mean? And it just uh, you got to walk. Here we are run. again. Make the tournament every year well, before you. Well, I guess that's fair, but it's also not like in, Indiana isn't exactly the little engine that could. Or it's not supposed to be, at least. Shit, it is though. All right, right now. Northwestern, a seven seed. Um, nice showing, you know. I mean, all year, get to the NCAA tournament. Um, beat Boise State in the first round. We both God, kind Boise of predicted sucked. that. Boise sucked, but they beat them. They didn't lose, so that's good. And then they went and, you know, played 40 minutes against UCLA. I didn't see much of this game. This is like one of the definitions of the problem with covering the NCAA tournament is you barely get to watch the NCAA tournament. Um, but... You know, look, I don't know if UCLA was ever really uh, particularly worried in this game, but Northwestern didn't get run. It was a respectable showing against a really good team. Yeah, it was kind of like what you wanted from Indiana. It was like they were a sparring partner. Like they were never yeah, going to knock yes. them out, but they were yes. like there to take the punches the whole time and didn't go away and play for them. Like, they credit, showed, like, like showed a backbone. Yeah, yeah. To be fair, though, like Northwestern has been losing games like that for a long time. It's a skill that's in the back pocket. <laughs> uh, it's not yeah, something yeah. And they really want but i good season for northwestern um uh, without a doubt like winning the ncaa tur- winning an ncaa tournament game is an accomplishment um I, I don't like what this is the same thing you could say what's next for them right like boo booey and chase Adige walked on senior night are they coming back for another year i can't really imagine that um and then where does that leave this project yeah, I mean, people forget a little bit. Like Chase Aldiz transferred from William and Mary and sat out a year and then played three years at Northwestern. Like, God, I don't know how old he is, but he ain't young. Um, Boo Booey, like, I I don't know. I there's a chance they're both back. In which case, like, that which case, great. I would probably predict they're a little worse than this year, but we'll see. <laughs> Like, I feel like they outperformed how good they are. Um, we'll see. I mean, it, you are right in that if Boo Booey and Chase Aldiz are back, everyone's going to be, like, picking Northwestern to finish, like, top four in the league, and we're going to be over here both rolling our eyes, picking them seventh, eighth. Um, I'm with you there. Um, I don't know what else there is to say about Northwestern. Congrats to Chris Collins on a contract extension, I imagine. There you go. I don't know if he signed it yet, but he, he will. it's coming one way or another. Um, Maryland. I got to watch Maryland uh, in Birmingham. Um, nice win over a tough ass West Virginia team in Ken Palm, um, in a game that was not played at Xfinity Center. So, props to the Terps for winning away from home, sixty-seven, sixty-five. Um, and then Randy that on the pod. It's like the one thing I got right. Um, and then ran into just an absolute buzzsaw. I mean, Alabama is just ridiculous. And the fact that it was a game in the first half, I thought was an achievement in and of itself that, you know, that they just didn't get their doors blown off in the first 10 minutes. And and they did to a degree establish like the style of play that they wanted. Julian Reese gets in some foul trouble. Um, Kevin Willer, not happy about that. And then the second half was kind of what I thought the, f- f- the second half was what I worried the, the 40 minutes were going to be. And it was just going to be, uh, a highlight show, you know, just 40 minutes of Alabama hanging on the rig. <laughs> um, so no, there's no no shame in going out to Alabama. I, I like the foundation that 
Willard's building there. I thought this was a good year in terms of like him installing whatever he wants to install, building some faith amongst his guys. Look at you rolling your eyes. Um, who knows what's back? Big questions there. Maryland could run it, the whole thing back um, if, if they want to. They they could have Jameer Young back, Dante Scott, Don, Dante Scott back, Hakeem Hart, Julian Reese. Um, I don't know if you want that. You might want some fresh blood, but um, I would take Jameer Young back in a heartbeat. That's for sure. Um, what do you think? First question. If you get run yeah. by 20 points and then say Dermot, do you complain about first half foul calls? No. Second question. Is this any different than a Mark Turgeon season? Like, are we going to, we watch Mark Turgeon <laughs> players have a Mark Turgeon season and we're going to say it's Kevin Willard turning the page? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, a t- team in the 20s, not quite as good as maybe they ever seem like they might be win one NCAA tournament game, then go home. Like, that's what Mark Turgeon did over and over and over again. Disagree? Not necessarily. Um, I mean, Mark Turgeon's first team went 17-5. and five, didn't he? Mark Turgeon didn't make the NCAA tournament until year four at Maryland. Okay, but, like, the re- like 2015 to 2020, Mark Turgeon that got run out of town, that's kind of what mm-hmm. his team did, uh, I would say. And second question is, is there any real reason to think a lot of these guys will be back? I would imagine Amir Young moves on. I imagine Don Scott moves on. Like, I don't know. I asked them. I mean, I had the conversations with them, and neither of them like gave the vibe of like no chance. I mean, Jameer Young did say to me, I'm not getting any younger, which was kind of a red flag. So um, the thing is, like, Willard does have a, a – a pretty darn good class coming in. I think he's got like three top 50 kids coming in. Maryland's also going to be a really, I think, attractive destination for the, from the portal partial in part because of the success Jameer Young had. Um, Like you, you can sell that. So, you know, it's all going to be about talent. And this, this group was relatively limited by the degree of talent that it had. Like, you know, Dante, Dante Scott and Hakeem Hart are like nice players, but like, they just never became like, really good players, you know? So, like, there was always going to be a cap of what this team could do. I do think they maxed out, no? That's fair. Yeah. And I think the biggest criticism of Turge was that they never maxed out. Okay. I I get that. I just think if you look at next year for Maryland and you just say, okay, if all the seniors go, I get they can come back. But what are you really building with? when you have sort of a stopgap season with Jameer Young. Like, all of a sudden, you have some good freshmen. Okay, great. I don't. I think that gets you somewhere. You have Julian Reese. I think you'd say, wow, he's going to be a really good player mm-hmm. for the junior. But mm-hmm. you need a lot in the portal, just like Indiana or whoever else, if you don't bring a lot of these guys back. And at the same time, if you're Kevin Willard, like, moving forward depends on – bringing in some new guy. Like, you do need to flip the page a little bit. I don't think you can just be the Dante Scott I agree. forever. No, I, I I think you... like D- D- Dante Scott moving on will probably be good at this point just because he is he is so specific to the type of player he is and, and, and what he does and just, you know, him backing down guys and, and getting his shots. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's how they want to play. Um... I mean, Jameer Young would at least give you just continu- like just having a senior point guard is just such a valuable piece to at least kind of direct things. And if you can surround him with some really talented freshmen and have a guy like Julian Reese bring in a transfer, like that's a team that you're you're you can at least have upward mobility. Yeah, I I see what you're saying. I just think the hard thing with Jameer Young is if Jameer Young's your point guard, Jameer Young's your team in a lot of ways, and. I just don't know if mm-hmm. that's the forever, and that's some of the cap on this team, right? Like, mate, like mate. I don't see a sort of Jalen yeah. Pickett type I, leap for him. Yeah, I, I would like to see, like, if if he was on a team with some shooters, like his ability to, like, like him penetrating and kicking right now. What is he kicking to? There's no, there's no shooters on the team, so like, if they could go get a couple of shooters and put them around him, um, you know, I think it could look pretty interesting. Um, yeah. But he's got to find the guys, and then you got to get them. Um, Interesting offseason up, for sure there, though. Very much so. Um, next up, your boys at Illinois. 
One and done. Arkansas. You almost conned me into picking they Illinois didn't get last back week together, when we had that the, the conversation about that game. <laughs> You almost caught me, and then I, I I rode with Arkansas, picked them to the Sweet 16, and uh, I'm fine with that. Illinois, goodbye. See ya. Done talking. About, I'm so done talking about this team. <laughs> yeah, they it, it, it just got out Illinois by Arkansas. Like, Arkansas really is – they were just more athletic, more one-on-one talent, and – that was enough to win that game. Uh, Illinois went down two point eight points points per possession. Yeah, they couldn't out like they have to out athletic people to score. It's just what does this look like next? Like, good grief! I have no idea what their roster yeah. looks like next year, and I assume it will be just a collection of hired guns that they try to slam together for five months all season. Right? Like that's just when what they hire- are. When you hire a JUCO coach, you get a JUCO program. And I feel like Brad. Un- this is how Brad Underwood rolls. He built this team this year. He's going to scrap this team this offseason. He's going to build a completely different one next year, would be my guess. Is that the New Mexico State motto? Because uh, they learned that the hard way also <laughs> in a far more dramatic uh, sense. I I think that's the only way. He- I agree. The only way forward is that what he's going to do. But – Get your popcorn because they're going to be fun. Like there's going to be all sorts of moves over the next six weeks, just <laughs> following Illinois Twitter reactions to whatever happens. Okay, so if the, of the players on the who played in that game, Coleman Hawkins, Terrence Shannon, R.J. Melendez, Dane Danger, Matthew Meyer, uh, Luke Goody, Ty Rogers, and Sear Harris, Jay Nets. I do like the freshman guard, the young guards, and, and I do think that there is a foundation there to build around. The question is, do you add supplemental parts and get young and talented around those guys? Or is he going to be bringing in like three swinging dicks who are going to come in and and think that they're taking over and going to be stars? You know, like that to me is the question in the roster construction at Illinois this year. But did you see the Coleman Hawkins? I saw on Twitter, like calling out people for being promised roles and calling out Sky Clark for quitting the team. I it's a fine line. I think honestly, I think Sky Clark is what killed this team more than the transfers and promising too much to the transfers. You can't go mm. into a season like this with a freshman point guard who doesn't really know what it takes and thinks he's he's the guy because that's not how you really mm. win in college basketball. I don't know. The problem I have is I don't know that. I'm all in on a team with like Jaden Knapp as the starting point guard next year either. Like, yes, he's a promising right. player, but I don't know. So you build like around Sincere Harris. I like yeah. Ty Rogers. Yeah, Ty Rogers is a great six man who can't shoot. That's kind of a big problem for a guy who's six right. six. Right. Do you like running your team through Coleman Hawkins? Uh, I don't know. But he's like very talented. <laughs> what is does he what does he do? Does he go to the NBA? I don't know. I, so Arthur Melendez, questions. I assume, will be back too. I could see him portaling. Like you could see anyone. You could literally see anyone on that team uh, going to the transfer uh, portal. Absolutely. You could tell me that there's two guys in the portal. You could tell me that there's ten guys in the portal. Yeah, it'll be a while. I don't know. I think it'll be a completely new team next year. Would be my guess. Um, and uh, we'll have as much fun with that one as we did this one. Next up. Man, what this is quite the uh, the funeral service here. Uh, Iowa, who was also with me in Birmingham, um, won and done against Auburn. Uh, that was it was like the most Iowa game ever. Uh, <laughs> fell behind, went to the press late, wasn't enough, and they lost. And that was it. Gave up anything points. else? Gave up 1.17 points per possession. Uh, that's not great. 218. That doesn't score. <laughs> it was seven in the in the SEC in offense. Hey, if you're Fran McCaffrey, are you trying to find a new job on the low? Oh. Um. 
That's a good question. It is. I mean, it's it is stale. Um, You're out of Murray. Fran has also. Fran, he's out of Murray. Fran has also. I mean, he has built a home in Iowa City in a big way, like very comfortable there. I think he has. A, isn't there another McCaffrey boy coming? Mm-hmm. Right. So he's in high school. And uh, is he graduating? I think he's the best one. Uh, I don't I think, think he's best graduating one yet. But I don't know for sure. Um, you know, 2025. Patrick, you know, already had kind of a difficult, difficult year. I don't know if you uproot and move. Um, I get your point, And I think it's a good question. And I would be curious to see his style of play outside of the Big Ten. Like, I, there is something to that of like, what would his way of doing things look like outside of this league? Notre Dame. And like the and the type of players that he could possibly get at a place that wasn't Iowa. Like what about Notre Dame? I don't know if I like it at Notre Dame. I just think it's. The I don't know if he's a fit at Notre. I don't know if he's a fit at Notre Dame. Maybe I don't know. He could be. I mean, his name's Fran McCaffrey, so <laughs> he would actually. Well, in that regard, it would be a pretty good fit. I, I mean, more of the the sideline stuff. I don't know if that would be a turnoff down there. Um, I'm just not sure where this is going. If Notre Dame doesn't hire Micah, then Notre Dame's dumb. But yeah, I, we can get to that in, in the next topic. But I'm okay. just saying, if I okay. I don't know, Rivera's done, right? Uh, Chris Murray's probably going to the league. Like you don't have like. For all we know, maybe Peyton Sanford will just turn into a monster next year. But I just feel like there's been a pipeline of like all American caliber players that there isn't next year. And what does it look like when you're still playing the 150th ranked defense, but your offense falls to 45th? Like, I I just I don't know where this is going at this point. And obviously it's like secure, but sometimes I just think it could be interesting for a game go. I don't know. Yeah. I would not be shocked if he moved on. I would, I would, to answer your question, it, would it be some like totally caught off guard thing? I don't think so. Um, but I, I think there's just a lot at play there um, in terms of them actually doing it. It feels very Ed Cooley Providence. Like, is he actually going to pull the trigger? Is he actually going to uproot the whole thing and, and take that show on the road? Um, now Fran's not from Iowa originally, so that's different. Ed Cooley's very much, um, house on the market, bro. Yeah, house on the market. Yeah, I saw that. Interesting. Um, yeah, there could be some major dominoes falling here, uh, very shortly. Um, things are about to get wild, so that's always fun. All right, who we got next? Penn State, going right in order here. Penn State, last one. Great Thursday, stuff uh, for the win night. over Texas A&M. Uh, I thought that was awesome that that group got that experience, got to go to a Big Ten tournament championship game, won three games to get there, um, including wins over Illinois and Indiana. Um, won an NCAA tournament game, beat um, a pretty good Texas A&M team, top 30 Ken Palm team, um, and, and beat them playing their way. You know, made 13 threes, shot 59% from beyond the arc, just absolute blowtorch, ran Buzz's ass right out of there. Um, that was awesome. That was great stuff. I'm happy for Penn State fans. Like, there are some very passionate Penn State fans that have been following this team for a long time, one of whom DM'd me on Thursday night to remind me of your take that Andrew Funk was going to cool off and would not keep making threes as he hit eight threes in an NCAA tournament game. So well done on that. But it's awesome for them to get the win. It's the first tournament win since 2001. First of all, I will not take criticism from Penn State fans. I've been riding Penn State for years. So whoever you are can get the hell out of here. I made one take about Andrew Funk and you give me shit. Andrew Funk made 112 threes this year, to be fair. (laughs) I think I said he might cool off. He did not cool off. He is still hot. But... I awesome run. And, and but I, I thought it almost just as impressive as beating Texas A&M was giving Texas a run. Um, like Texas 
really good team. When when Penn State went on that 10-0 run, mm-hmm. be shit. Like this is awesome. This might be one of like the best stories of the NCAA tournament. And then Texas came right back with its own 10 over run. And uh that was obviously a a bummer. But um great stuff from year one of Micah. And if you want to talk about a team that's year starting two. over, I'm sorry, year two of Micah. Um you want to talk talk about a team that might be starting over. I mean, this could be a wholesale change in Happy Valley, but at least everyone got um got you know just a moment that everyone will remember yeah happy for the penn state fans to have thursday night well monday morning might be a little rough because now you might have <laughs> a new coach new team and who knows enjoy it while it lasts if you're mike uh, do you take providence or notre dame oh i take notre dame without question okay he is he worked for the Celtics, right so we have some New England roots in there, but I agree. Like, yeah, that's great. I mean, I mean, in all regard, I mean, money, facilities, you know, ability to pay staff, everything. I, I and if I'm like a, the amount of turnover in the ACC right now makes that league pretty darn attractive. Um, to go in there and say, uh, I'm going to turn Notre Dame into a top three or four program in this conference in the next two years. Yeah, I agree. Doable. Um, um, a better yeah. portal destination. I mean, actually, it might not be a better portal destination just because of transfer, credit transfers and all that shit. Yeah, cool. That might actually be tough. Breaking in transfers. Yeah, yeah. Providence, I'm pretty sure the doors are not locked at Providence. Um, Notre Dame might be a tougher sell, but uh, I, I, th- I think Micah, I mean – yeah, he was at the Celtics. Well, he was also at Purdue. Yeah, he's, he's an Indiana, Indiana guy. guy. Like, go, go put him in South Bend and let him go to work. He'll, he'll get it done. I, I agree. I just, I'm just curious. Like, I feel like those are going to be two of the bigger openings potentially. Um, I, I think I, some people have said it to me, like, "Oh, is he overrated because this team was just really old?" This, that, and the rest. I think what they had and how they optimized it was really as impressive of a kind of on-court basketball and roster building mm. success as really anyone in the country. Like I, I get that they weren't this amazing team there. There was, they were 14 and 11, five and nine at one point, but they yeah. figured out how to build an entire team around Jalen Pickett. They recruited Jalen Pickett. It's not like everyone wanted Jalen Pickett two years ago. Um, so I think I really like just, how they play and what he was able to do. And I think that's something if I was hiring a head coach, I would buy all in on right now. So I get that there's like, also if I'm Micah, I'm out the door because that whole team's gone. So you need, you need a new, oh, yeah. new spot. Oh yeah. I did love the report. Like Penn state is prepared to offer Micah Shrewsbury a, a, a large package and blah, blah. Yeah. No shit. Of course you are. <laughs> Coach just took the team the NCAA tournament. It's one of the great commodities on the league. It would be malpractice for Penn State to sit there with, you know, its thumb up its ass. Like, yeah, it's a Big Ten program. It should be able to muster, uh, hey, here's four and a half million a year, and here's this, and here's that. Like, Penn State's not some broke-ass program on the side of the road. Um, you know, it might look that way some nights at Bryce Jordan. But, um, like, yeah, Penn State needs to step up here. And at least make it a hard decision. I don't think it's a hard decision, but you got to make it a hard decision. That's on them. I, I right? agree. Okay. Um, do, do you have anything else you want to get on on the way out of here? I got 10 minutes. Beth Lundy, your transfer portal, long line. If that happens, it might be leaves. Oh, boy. There'll be a lot of Big Ten teams in that in that line, I think. I, I, if, you, if you're not in that line, you need to be coached. But, uh, I I think there's going to be going to be a wild off season because I know you said so many teams like which teams are really bringing back significant cores when we talk through that list not a not a whole lot um, and I, there are some super senior decisions and whatnot but if some of those go different ways I think how the Big Ten reloads will shape how good the league is next year and that that's the biggest takeaway because. There's a lot of work that a lot of these head coaches have to do, especially for the teams that didn't even make the tournament. So fun times coming up over the next eight weeks. I think the Big Ten 
outside of Illinois, maybe didn't do enough in the portal last year. So it'll be interesting if they can adjust. What do you want to hit on Michigan at all? Uh, we can. I, um, I mean, what what, just, what was just kind of your your thoughts coming? Overriding thoughts on the conclusion of the season. I don't think anyone particularly cares about the loss to uh, Vanderbilt, other than that it ended in a great encapsulation of the season as a whole. Um, you know, I'm sure people have some takes about who did and didn't play in that game, but whatever. Uh, what, what are, what's kind of your overriding thought on on Michigan? Yeah, I thought Michigan would get run without Kobe playing. And then they actually, mm-hmm. they like started to get run and then played pretty well and were in position to win it. Uh, obviously, three turnovers in the last minute, not going to win you the game. But either way, like, I don't think like, that game is fairly insignificant. Uh, like, Cody Buckton sat out, but he was also, like, it looked like limping when they showed him on the thing. So I do think he probably had some ankle injury. I don't mm-hmm. think anyone with an NBA future would play through much of an injury in the NIP. Um, end of the day, like, now is when. I would say this, like you can have a bad season, but you can't let you can't have two bad seasons. And I think like John Beeline did this twice during his tenure where things went very sideways. He made changes and got things back on track. And the things that you do in the next eight weeks really kind of shape that picture, right? Like there's going to be NBA draft stuff, transfer portal stuff. Um, Isaiah Barnes already portaling. Um, you got to reshape this roster in a way. And there's a lot of kind of open questions. Um, they're talking now about Joey Baker coming back, Jalen Llewellyn's knee, like all these things, assistant coaching speculation, right? Like Saudi Washington mm-hmm. in the mix at Buffalo. There's a lot of yep. a lot of moving pieces, and the decisions you make to resettle the pieces, I think, shape what's to come. And that's that's an opportunity, but if you make the wrong decisions, that could turn one problem into two. Yeah, and I I mean <clears throat> Juwan is always gonna have, I think. NBA interest and with with Jet going to the league, presumably, um, you know, is that more interesting when an offer comes? You know, there's what? How, what would you guess is the average amount of NBA coaching changes in any offseason? Like eight? I don't know. I probably don't play close enough attention, but it seems like, you know, there's a whole new fleet of coaches every year in the NBA. Um, like Juwan's always going to get calls. When those jobs come open, um, he has already said no to the Knicks. He's already said no to the Lakers. Um, but that was different when he knew because he knew Jet was on the way. And, you know, he's now done this, what, four years at Michigan? Um, what, what are his thoughts? We're not in his head. So I'm, I am curious what his thoughts are when those calls come this year. Um, also, though, like the problem for the, the problem for the for Michigan it, is also that. Uh, NBA coaching carousel does not match up with college coaching carousel. Yeah, um, that's definitely true. But, but go ahead. The other thing is you have to wonder, like, there'd be more calls two years ago coming off of a top 10 season. I don't think the NBA cares about wins and losses in college. I get that. And a big part of that makes sense because roster building, how you recruit the transfer portal, whatever else doesn't matter. But the reality is, like, there is an extent to which I would say winning matters in terms of how. Well, yeah, and and, what, and in the NBA, they look at Juwan's recipe or resume and they say he took Michigan to the Sweet 16, uh, the Elite Eight, and they would have been in the tournament in his first year. I mean, they don't care about the specifics of what's happened in Ann Arbor the last four years, right? They don't. No way. It's Juwan Howard, and he has had his success at Michigan. There's a difference between like coming off a of coach of the year season and not, though. But, right. Two years ago, he was national coach of the year. I think that's a little different. It's going to get you like NBA owners are yeah, going to read the news. They're going to see that. Right. It's it's a different situation to an extent. And it, it, it and it's still on the resume. It's just because they lost this year doesn't take off the fact that he was a national coach of the year while at Michigan. And that's fair. Like I, I don't disagree. I'm just kind of playing that. I that think he's game. uber. I think he remains highly, highly attractive to the league. Um, and he'll have decisions to make when, if, when that those calls come again. So, um, and if he's back at Michigan, yeah, you're right. You know, staff could look maybe a little bit different if, if or there's plenty of smoke with Saudi and Buffalo. 
Um, who knows what happens there? Who knows what options Howard Isley has? Um, you know, I could imagine there's calls there, and he could always have NBA interest as well. Um, Bill, I don't think, is going anywhere unless there is a change at the top. Um, there's no reason to think otherwise. So, yeah, between the between that, though, and all those question marks on the roster, um, interesting stuff. My Out of Kobe, Jet, Hunter Dickinson, who's back? I take would be no one. Um, that would, I take I, would be no one. Yes, I, I would say that or Hunter are the most likely candidate. I would say my guess would be Dickinson back, barring Juwan to the league. I think Ju- if Juwan jumped, that could that would that would more so than him leaving for the NBA. If Juwan jumped, I, I think it would at least make it worth taking a look at what other options would be to play in college. Yeah. I don't, if Dickinson leaves, it would not be to the NBA. Correct. Yeah. I, there's, that's not like really a valid not option, option for him, but the transfer portal is and like, depending on what else shakes out. I think those are real options. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's things to think about in that respect. And it's like, yeah, especially if Juwan Howard were to leave, I think, I don't see yeah. much. I mean, it, obviously, it depends who hired to replace them or whatnot. But I would imagine. And I'll tell you what. Hmm. There is a scenario like we throw out all these options of people going and blah blah blah. Like, there's also the possibility like Juwan is going nowhere. Dickinson is going nowhere. You can, you know, you talk Buffkin into a, a, another year, and Michigan also a very desirable could be a very desirable transfer. Uh, destination because there is talent you can win um and there's men you know you could you, there are there are plenty of minutes available because as we've talked about you know the biggest issue with this team was there was high end talent and then a major gulf to what was left on the court and they need a total upgrade i think in across the board talent yeah the back half of the rotation wasn't good enough i think like, yeah, if you bring back Kobe Buffkin and Hunter Dickinson, all of a sudden you're rocking and rolling, you yeah. plug in a transfer, you have Doug McDaniel, all of a sudden you're a contender. Uh, it's just a mm-hmm. very – it's a very fine line. You're trying to really thread the needle there. Um, like, you'd be like, Kobe, hey, you're the youngest player on the team. Next year's draft is weak. Come back and be All-American. Like, sure, there's a pitch there. It's also like, okay, Kobe, go be the 19th pick in the draft and become a pro. And Absolutely. Hard to, yep. hard to bet against that. But it'd be a bit, lot to play out. Um, there'd be a lot of just general movement all around the, the league, around Michigan. It'll be a fascinating offseason. I feel like the transfer portal has created like a new phenomenon in covering college basketball where it's just pure chaos for eight weeks when it used to just be like vacations. Um, so that's been a, that's a fun twist. Hmm. All right. I think that's it. All right, let's wrap. We will obviously. Sorry, Wisconsin more, NIT uh, T run. They have to make make it to Vegas before we'll cover that. You're going to stay in Vegas to cover the NIT finals, right? Obviously, get a full embed with the Badgers. <laughs> uh, all right, that'll do it for this week. We appreciate everyone listening. Uh, enjoy another week of the NCAA tournament. Um, we will be back next week, probably to talk about at least a quick hitter on what happens with Michigan state one way or another. Um, and then maybe some other, I'm sure there will be all kinds of movement this week, coaching changes, some roster moves. There will be some stuff to discuss next Monday and we will be back with that. So talk to you then.